right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to glad to see you guys out tonight for this Light in the Darkness conference. Hey, there we had these uh, schedules here. Chad has. If you didn't get a schedule and you would like one of these, I just raise up your hand. Chad will hook you up. And uh, and then also in the foyer, uh, we have these journals and some pens. If you want to grab a journal and pen, they're in the foyer. Um, or maybe uh, somebody will run and grab those. But right in the table in the, in the front, so if you want uh, something, Pastor Dale will grab a couple. So if you want a journal or a pen, uh, hook yourself up. All right. And, and uh, we are really looking forward to what the Lord has for us this weekend. I'm blessed to know that, that you're here. And, um, and just keep your hands up. These guys will, these guys will get to you. Uh, just really, really thankful that so many have turned out to consider what the Lord might want to do in our community and... Uh, Really what we're here to consider is how the Lord is shining His light into the darkness. Uh, right here, there's a lot of, a lot of darkness. Um, you know, as things starting to lighten up a little bit COVID-wise, and people in places like Oregon don't even have to wear masks now, um, my greatest fear is that everything goes back to normal. Uh, th- although as, as crazy challenging as things have been, there has been a, a resurgence and an awareness of our need as human beings that has surfaced over the last couple of years that have given great opportunities for the gospel. And because of that, I'm excited uh, that we're here to discuss that very work of God. The Lord shines a light into the darkness. The Lord redeems people's hearts. And so the purpose of this conference is to consider that light that the Lord is already shining. Of course, it's our desire to grow in, in going out and being a light. Uh, but the, the conference isn't just a rah-rah conference, such as, hey, go win some people to Jesus. Why don't you let your light shine a little brighter than you've been letting it shine? Although the Lord gives us that exhortation, we'll certainly receive it. But mostly, it's, it's, I want to, for us to grow in our awareness of the darkness and, and to, uh, to grow in our compassion for those that, that are in need of the gospel, that we might view a broken community with Christ's heart, and with Christ's eyes. As he looked upon the multitudes, he was filled with compassion for them. And, and I also want us to leave the conference with a fresh appreciation that God, who is light, is shining. He can't help but shine and speak light into dark places. And so my job is to be the Bible teacher. And uh, so I'm going to, in this first session, share really a biblical theology of light. And then we'll, we'll open it up and we have oh another... Uh, 16 speakers or so over, the, over today and tomorrow that will just share their, their practical touch to, into the community, uh, ways that the Lord has been working in them, through them, things that, that they're seeing. I'm just really looking forward to that, the, the practical side to this conference. But first, let me blast you with some Bible verses, shall we? All right, uh, here's just a few, um, and then we'll open up to 2 Corinthians in a second, but I have these, these on, on the screen. Uh, what, is the, what does the Bible say about light? Well, uh, you, you're probably uh, well familiar uh, with uh, Genesis and how the whole Bible begins. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, but then when you get to Genesis 1-3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Let's throw verse 3 back up there one more time. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And I just want to, you know, to focus in on the words of this well-familiar verse. God said, let there be light. And then what happened? There was light. So when God speaks and commands light, to shine into dark places, it shines. 
And, and throughout Scripture, it's, it's one thing that we see is that the Lord calls men out of darkness. And he speaks light. And, and he, something like scales fell off Paul's eyes, Saul's eyes, right, when he saw the light on the Damascus road. And so at the, even the start of the conference, I just want to be a church that, that prays that God does this. I advocate uh, God-centered praying when it comes to evangelism. There's two ways of praying when it comes to evangelism. There's the one prayer, Lord, I pray that we would <laughs> be more evangelistic, that we would be bold to share our faith, that, that your church would. And certainly those, those prayers are both biblical and needed. But I love, my heart loves the other kind of praying. Lord, I pray that you would. Lord, I pray that you would shine light into dark hearts in this community. And, and so God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, interestingly, as you know the days of creation, Genesis 1 says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And that light was not the light of the sun or the moon or the stars. It was the light of himself that radiated and lit up all creation, for the sun was not created until day four. The plants were even created before the sun. And in day four, that's when the Lord created the two great lights. Uh, we know that God needs not the sun to shine. And he himself shines. Isaiah 60 verse 19 says, uh, to the children of Israel, here prophecy, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor... The, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. This is backed up in the New Jerusalem in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. Uh, the city had no need of the sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. Illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And so when we see God in glory and when we see the Lord in heaven, there will be no sun, there will be no moon, but it'll be the very light of God that will illuminate our eternal resting place. That's glorious, isn't it? We're just going to be in the light of God. And so as we build a th biblical theology of light, it begins with just this simple premise that God is light. And that light is actually seen through his son. But, but listen to 1 John 1, 1.5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So when we begin this A Light in the Darkness conference, we begin by setting our sights on God who is light and in him no darkness dwells. Now, we know the problem with darkness, and darkness originated in men's hearts because of sin. Throughout Scripture, light is used metaphorically of righteousness, of people that walk in the light, walk in the Lord's path, because God is light, and all he does is done in the light. There's no need for shame or hiding in the Lord, that all is good and right and upstanding. Good works don't need to be hidden. And because God is light, light is used metaphorically of righteousness within Scripture, walking with the Lord in the light. But we, and so also darkness is used metaphorically throughout Scripture to speak, to speak of walking in wickedness or in shameful behavior, such as when Adam and Eve sinned and had to hide from the presence of the Lord. And so men love darkness rather than the light. And so the, the world was dwelling in darkness. In fact, the prophecy of, for the Lord Jesus when he came, uh, he would come to a people sitting in darkness. Those that sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon them the light has, has shined. And that's why John 1, 4, speaking of Jesus, says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we know hell is a place of outer darkness. The day of the Lord's judgment is considered a day of darkness. 
and apart from the Lord's presence is utter darkness. But being in the Lord's presence is light and life. And so that's why Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am, uh, yeah, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me should not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And who is this little ditty spoken to? Who, whom did Jesus uh, share this? What does John 8, 12 follow? You know the story, right? The woman caught in adultery. She's brought out from a dark place. Uh, her and the man, they were committing, you know, these two as they were committing adultery. Obviously, we're not hoping to be found out and dragged out into the city where this shameful deed that should be done behind closed doors is now out for everybody to see. And, uh, and then, of course, we know that, that the Lord does not condemn her, forgives her, and then just simply says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me would not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And there's just this thing about coming to the Lord and bring, coming out into the light and having all our sin forgiven. And that's why Jesus came, to bring people out of the shame and the darkness of sin. To bring them out of the, those closet, shameful situations, the darkness of the heart, the ramifications of sin in their life. And to bring them into the light. And so when somebody is a born-again Christian... Uh, they, they begin to walk in the light. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, you, not just in the darkness, <laughs> you notice that? <laughs> you were darkness. Jesus said, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Like, like the light of the body is the eye. But if, you, if everything within you is dark and you're living in sin, uh, how great is that darkness? And for the born-again Christian, Ephesians 5, 8, you were once in that place. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so we're to walk as children of the light. And so how glorious it is when the Lord brings us out of our darkness and brings us into his marvelous light. When our sin is forgiven and our, and our hearts are new and we can walk according to the light of his word and we can walk in the light of his path. His word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And and we have this light, uh, this brightness of eyes, because the Lord's shining in. Uh, but then Jesus did say this, and I told you I wasn't going to make the conference all about this, but, but I think it's important for us to consider. Um, out of all of the Lord's I am statements, and there are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know, all of those things. Uh, there was only one of them that he, he flipped around on us, right? He didn't say you were the bread of life, he didn't say you were the way, the truth, and the life, but he did say in Matthew five fourteen, you are the light of the world. And the sun-moon analogy is perfect there. Of course, the moon has no light in itself, but it merely reflects the light of the sun. So the Christian, no, no real light in ourself other than we reflect the light of the S-O-N, the Son of God. And so he is our light and we reflect his light. So if Jesus is the light of the world, through the Christian, we then become the light of the world. So Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Meaning when we're walking in the light, and that you, you, it just can't be hidden, uh, like a, a, a city up on a hill. And uh, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that, that are in the house. And so Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so the Lord has called us to walk in the light, and then be a light to others. But here's the problem with this, because this biblical theology of light sounds all fine and dandy and exciting, doesn't it? I'm in the light. Jesus is shining in me. Jesus is shining through me. Uh, Jesus wants me for a light bulb, you know. This is great. And But then I go to shine my light around the world, and people aren't necessarily too uh, happy about it. And, and hence the need for a conference like this. Because there's a real darkness. There's a Bible verse for this. Uh, it's John 3.19, a couple of them, actually. Three, John 3.19 and 20. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light, 
Why? Because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light <laughs> and does not want to come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. And so it is as faithful Christians, as we walk in the light and we live according to that light, uh, our light will be to some people like a, a, like a teenage boy oversleeping when mom comes in and flips the light on and then rips the covers away. <laughs> It's like, no, I want to like, no, you know, peels back the curtains. No, like he's a vampire or something. And so it is that just like Paul said about the aroma, there, there's this aroma that we have as Christians. To some, it's aroma of life leading to life. But other, it's like the repulsive smell of death. And they're reminded that their life isn't right. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 5, all things that are made manifest are made manifest by the light. And so we're not to share in the sinful and dark practices of sinners, but rather we're to expose them by living in the light. But to be sure, as our light shines and sin is exposed, people won't be happy. Some will be, many won't be, but nonetheless, God's called us to let that light shine. And so six quick verses before I hand it over to Hannah from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, and six things here about this ministry that we have. First off, in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, first off, let me just read these six verses. And then I'm just going to note one quick thing about each, all, each six, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves your bondservants. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. First off, we would recognize that the ministry that is being spoken of in verse 1 of chapter 4 is a ministry of light. Um, of us uh, reflecting the light of Jesus and then sharing that light, ministering that light. And, and so I just want to encourage you with the, the words from verse 1 here from the Apostle Paul. As you have received this ministry, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. The, it, it can be really tiring, desiring to communicate the gospel to people around you. It can be the, the most difficult conversation to ever strike up. It's the, maybe one of the greatest areas of failure that Christians continually feel like they succumb to. Who like, oh, like, I, like we hear the word evangelism, we're like, I know I need to do that more. But it's so hard. Don't lose heart. The Lord has opportunities for you, believer. I believe it. People he's placed in your life. And he's the one shining the light. You've received this ministry to be a light for Christ, to let Christ's light shine in you. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. And even if your, la your past has been checkered by either failure in evangelism or lack of evangelism and lack of just having Godward conversations with unbelievers, realize the Lord can still use you to do that. Don't lose heart. Look for those opportunities. 
Uh, next, I would see in, in verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things of shame, Paul said. We don't walk in craftiness. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know what commends Christians to men's consciences? Walking in the light. Not walking in craftiness, not walking in deceit. But when we live Christ-centered lives, you don't even have to say anything. There's something about the very light of Christ shining in you, shining through you to others. I don't know how to be an evangelist. I don't know how to breach those conversations. Well, the very first thing we would say is just live a biblical life. Put your life in the Lord's pathway. Walk in his light, and guess what? You'll be like a glow-in-the-dark toy. You're in the light with the Lord, and now you're illuminated in this dark world by being with Jesus, by being in the way with Jesus. And so if you don't know what to do, do this. Walk in the light of God's word. Walk according to its principles. Walk according to, to what the Lord calls you to, and your life will be a light. You'll let your light so shine before men in that way. Uh, the, next, the next verse, verse 3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those that are perishing. This verse reminds us that people that hate the gospel are going to die eternally because of their rejection of the gospel. And so it is there that we can have some compassion on people even when they make our lives difficult. But in their rejection of the gospel, they're going to perish. Though if our gospel is veiled, if somebody doesn't like it, if somebody wants us to shut up about it, censor us in speaking it, we need to have compassion on those people because they're blind to it and they are perishing. I'm reminded of the man that woke his, was bragging to his buddies at bar closing about his bride, his Christian wife at home who would do anything for him, even make him and his friends bacon and eggs at two in the morning. And they said, you're crazy. No wife would do that. And he said, oh, I will. And I'll show you. And he brought his friends home from the bar and dragged her out of bed and demanded bacon and eggs and she put a smile on her face and her robe on and made bacon and eggs and with a cheery attitude and served him and his friends and finally one of them was so disgusted by it not by the bacon and eggs those are really good but he just said he's like why do, would you put up with this and he and uh she said oh you see i know jesus as my savior and lord and when i die i'm going to heaven this is as worse as it's ever going to be for me. But my poor sap of a husband, he doesn't know Jesus. And when he dies, he's going to go to hell. And this is as good as it's ever going to be for him. So I just figure I make his stay on earth here as pleasant as possible. <laughs> and, you know, like compassion for this guy. She like had it in perspective. And, you know, like there are times that unbelievers make our lives miserable. And we need the put it into perspective and say, you know what? This is as, as good as it's ever going to be for them. And uh, this is as bad as it's ever going to be for me. And, and I, I, want to sh I want to see them one to the gospel. Then in, in verse 4, we see who's blinded their minds. It says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who did not believe, lest the light of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. The God of the age here in verse 4 reminds us, of, uh, it speaks of Satan here. This is a spiritual battle. And Christian, can I remind you, you're in a spiritual battle. The enemy is the one who's actively at work blinding minds and hearts, keeping people hidden from the gospel. And I tell you, there are times it becomes very palpable, this spiritual battle that you're in. If you ever try to go out street witnessing or really aim to, to engage, you'll, you'll recognize that you're in a spiritual warfare. And there's th that the enemy is going to do everything he can to resist that work. And so our great weapon here is prayer. 
We need to be prayed up and pray and, and ask that the Lord would open up eyes and ask that the Lord would make his word effective, that he give success. And so, Christian, God wants to shine his light into the darkness here. And I believe that prayer is a powerful weapon because we have an enemy. And then in verse 5, it says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. The message of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel is not wrangling about young earth, old earth, although I believe beginning at creation can be a nice gateway for the gospel. But the gospel is not um, about uh, the, the varying practices of the differing religions. The gospel isn't like, what do we do with the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6? Again, another interesting uh, conversation. The gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's a simple message. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again to give you life if you place your faith in him. It's a simple message, but it's the most powerful message on earth. Somebody may preach the gospel better than you, but they could never preach a better gospel than you. And the gospel is founded on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it's a simple message. And today people need to hear about Jesus. And verse five simply says, we don't preach ourselves. We don't preach Calvary Chapel. Although sometimes just inviting somebody to church can be a great way of getting them in the door. But we preach Jesus, our Lord. And then the last thing I want to share is that in verse 6, it says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts, or it is the God. I like this. And so verse 6, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And praise God... Let me count quick. I Praise God. If you're a Christian, slip up your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you were born saved, keep your hand up. Okay. If you were ever in darkness, slip up your hands. Okay. If you ever rejected the Lord, this might be a different number because some of you were raised in Christian homes. And, uh, and, you, and, 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 and of course you were redeemed. But if you, as some, maybe as a teenager or as, or as an adult, actually decided that God wasn't real and that you weren't going to follow him and that you, you actually tried to reject him, I, that's me. If that's you, raise up your hand. There's the light shining into dark places. And, and, pray, and, and praise God no matter where our testimony has come from. But I would be the last. If you met me in my unbelieving years, I got saved at 21 and about three quarters. Uh, I, you would have never thought it even possible that I could become a Christian. That's how hard-hearted I was and antagonistic I was to street preachers that tried to communicate the gospel to me. And the Lord shined into this darkness. And all I want to say is that there are believers out there that are still unbelievers. There's people that will be soon walking in the light that are right now rooted in darkness. Um, Denise's friend, what, what's her name? Liz. Liz got saved at the eye doctor, or by visiting the eye doctor. She was a liberal, atheist, angry woman. And she's at the eye doctor and sees a chart of the human eye and realizes how complex it is and goes home and sitting in her bedroom says, there's a God. And I've been cursing him my whole life. And she fell off the bed and onto, the, onto her knees and repented of her sin, mostly her unbelief and her rejection of him. And the Lord saves people. And you know when he saves people? As 
this verse says, 2 Corinthians verse 4, verse 6, it's when he commands light to shine out of darkness, to shine into our hearts, to reveal the face of Christ. And when the Lord says, let there be light, there is light. And no sinner can... Darkness doesn't overcome light. You know that, right? Light dispels darkness. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. So uh, rather than coming up and introducing each of our speakers, let me just introduce uh, the first three and and hopefully four. I think we'll have time to do four. So uh, right now... um, I just have one, one additional one. If you have that sheet here, um, we're going to hear in order uh, from Hannah Helsby, uh, then Steve Merriman, um, Emily Barr, and then, and then uh, John Fricke here in this uh, first session. Uh, Hannah, a, a, a dear friend and uh, serving with, with her family in Africa, they call that the dark continent, right? Uh, and so she knows all about darkness. Uh, she had served there for a lot of years with her family, uh, but, um, but now here she's serving at, at, at our community through, uh, through, uh, at the Bozeman Police Department, and just so thankful for Hannah, for her witness. Uh, she loves the glory of God. She's been a deep, a longtime friend. Can't wait for her to share and, and what the Lord has for her. Uh, then Steve Merriman, one of our elders, is going to come up and share, and he's been teaching guitar at Bozeman High for, I don't know, 30 years or something. <laughs> just, he's not that old, but it's been a while. Yeah, I'm kidding. That's just me being funny. Um, and uh, so, uh, but yeah, Steve, just working with the young people each and every day, and, and just can't wait to hear what the Lord has, has uh, to have for us uh, through his eyes at the high school. And then Emily uh, Barr, she got called into this discussion because she just she's uh, doing a little internship here at the church. I put cold smoke. She works at a coffee house, but that's not necessarily her number one uh, thing. I think she's going to do potatoes next. But uh, she just shared this little little testimony of something the Lord had given her about being set apart. And I said, well, you're, you have to share that at the conference. And then John Fricke is going to come up last before that. And then we'll have a little break after that. And John, of course, serving with the sheriff's office, Pastor Dale and Denise's oldest son. I met John when he was uh, probably 15, 15 years old. And, and uh, um, he was as big then as he is now. And so, uh, but yeah, John's got a great heart, served in the detention center uh, for a while before the sheriff's office, and, or with the sheriff's office there as well. But I'm just looking forward to hearing from each of these. Yeah, so my name's Hannah Helsby. I have been with Bozeman PD for about two years. Before that, I did EMS with Amar in town for the ambulance. Um, And yeah, I'm working a late shift now. I work night shift on the weekends, so probably won't be pulling any of you over unless you're big into like college parties. We probably won't be seeing you, which is a good thing. Um, We go to a lot of those on the weekend. So yeah, I'm... um, just glad that Calvary's putting this conference on, and um, I think it's important to talk about uh, the light and the darkness of our community in all roles. I think maybe law enforcement and first responders are what come to mind for people, because we're often um, maybe coming into dramatic situations, and our jobs look very exciting, and and I think I have the best job. I love my job, Um, but I think it's really important for all of you guys to know that um, I've seen how impactful it is in in all employment areas um, that we have believers in in all fields um, in the hospitals in uh, mental health in schools um, in restaurants coffee shops how important that is uh, for us all to be a community working together because we do I might come into the most dramatic moments but Usually that's not where a lot of things are solved. I can solve very few things. I can take people to jail or the hospital, and that's kind of it. Um, so a lot of people are are kind of desperate for that community and desperate for just relationship building, and that's not something that I, I do a lot. I do 
see frequent people um, who I have some something of a relationship with, but it's usually taking them back to jail repeatedly. So I don't hang out with them on my off time, I guess. So, um, yeah, so just as Pastor Ted was talking about, just the brokenness in our community, a lot of what that looks like in our field, and John will share more of this later, but um, just brokenness in terms of domestics, uh, drugs, abuse, um, just people's overall despair especially in the last two years, um, and alcohol. Um, there's just, there's a lot of alcohol and drugs in this valley and that precipitates all kinds of consequences down the road um, with all those other, other issues too. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm brand new, uh, been on for two years, but I, I'm just getting my feet under me, I feel like. And um, I think it's been two years of seeing kind of the, depravity of man. So when I was asked to share here, I was trying to think, you know, I think um, I was thinking we were hoping to talk about, you know, how have you seen God at work in your place of work? And it was kind of hard to think of a lot of instances where where there have been positive things that I encounter because um, it's not usually a good day when the cops are at your house. And even for normal people, it's not a good day when you get pulled over, and um, so we end up bringing a lot of bad news or being bad news in somebody's day. And so it was easy to just think, you know, what in seeing more and more depravity of man in my two years of law enforcement, what can I share um, that the Lord is doing in our community? And um, it's not hard to list the things that I've learned about who God is through my job. So I think that's what I'll just focus on tonight in seeing more and more of the darkness of people. Um, the light looks better and better to you. Um, and so a lot of us obviously know that the world is broken. Um, people are depraved through our own experiences. I'm sure you all have um, instances that you've seen that in your life and I did in my life before law enforcement. but. Um, it's just a different level when you constantly get called into people's messes, um, some of which have been going on a very long time, longer than I've been alive, and you just get called there and you just try to kind of sort it out and pray your way through it and hope that the Lord has um, a solution for them because it's out of, of your control. Um, but yeah, I think learning more and more about man's depravity and hearing horrible stories of what people do to each other even here in our valley um, and seeing the drugs and alcohol abuse here it's given me a lot more um, just looking to to the Lord for solutions um, because he's the only chance that we have here um, and he he looks better and better against contrasted against the the darkness that I see on a regular basis so um, yeah, so I wanted to share some stories with you guys. I think that's what people usually like to hear. Um, and I do have a lot of stories, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, and um, something that came to mind was just a, something I think about on a regular basis. We, we got called to a hotel for some kind of a family disturbance. Um, and the person in the room next to them could hear yelling, sounded like a mom was yelling at a kid and maybe hitting the kid. So we showed up, um, got everybody separated, and then, um, yeah, I just as a side note, I work with really outstanding people, and as a brand new officer, I'm just privileged to learn from them every day. So my sergeant was on scene, and he separated everybody, and he handed me the little girl, and he said, here, you take care of her, um, and I'll go deal with the mom. Um, and basically what had happened was the kid got into some candy. She was about five. She was really little for five. Um, she got into some candy and so the mom just started hitting her and hit her right in the face with a shoe. Um, so the kid was like bleeding and her eye was all swollen. So I took her over to the, the patrol car and just gave her like some stickers and something to draw and I drew with her for a little bit. And um, the mom ended up going to jail for a number of things, but um, the sergeant went and bought some 
waffles. He asked, what do you like for breakfast? And she said, well, we don't, I like McDonald's, but we don't get to go there anymore, is what she said. So he went, McDonald's was closed. So he went and bought her some waffles and he came back to the station and he just sat down with her. He's um, this big guy, he's, a, he's an awesome cop. He could beat up any of us any day of the week. And he just sat down with her and um, drew a picture with her and made her some breakfast. And, um, and I just was, I've thought about that instance a lot and just thinking that this is also um, a light in the darkness. This is God's heart for our community and for kids who don't have a voice and kids who are helpless and, and people who are desperate. And so a lot of times um, maybe our work as being light in the darkness is not sitting down with mom and explaining the gospel. It's actually getting that kid out of there and getting her um, fed and loved and um, I had to go through the hotel room and it was just full of alcohol, um, but her mom wouldn't buy her food anymore. Full of alcohol and then the kid was just sleeping on like a like a comforter on the floor and it was filthy, um, like you wouldn't want your dog to sleep on it, you know. So, um, yeah, so that was just an in instance of seeing um, God's purpose for us in law enforcement beyond, um, you know, being able to have enough time to share the gospel with someone in the back of my car on the way to jail. Sometimes that's happened, but it's actually very rare. And so just seeing more, um, God has a huge heart for justice and he loves He loves um, justice, even, even here on earth where it's not gonna be perfect and we're looking forward to a better world someday. So um, yeah, so it, in the midst of all of that, it's been easy to focus on how bad people are because there's a lot of stories every day and, and they get worse and worse. Um, and even things that I'm directly involved in or hearing stories from other officers about what they encountered that day, um, there's just bad things going on. And it's easy to get um, lose, lose focus on the fact that I also have that same seed of depravity in me and apart from the Lord, I would be capable of any any of those things and it's easy to think of you know the 99 percent of the good community and then the one percent that's destroying the community that we need to deal with um, instead of realizing that all of us need jesus and we all need um, the light and that i'm as bad off as they are so i a while back i started realizing that that's my tendency is to think you know well, I kind of am better than some of these people. You know, it's easy to say like, yeah, we're all bad and we have all our issues until you hear some of the stories of what people do to kids and and these really messy relationships and you think, well, I, I kind of am a little better than that, you know? I wouldn't do that. So I was just, the Lord had, was very kind to just um, walk me through that and um, regularly confront me with other people's depravity and remind me that I also deserve to be where they are and worse. Um, so a while back, I just printed off a uh, note card to carry just in my, my vest, in my body armor every day and try to remember it before shift. Um, and it's Titus 3, 1 through 7, and it says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect cur courtesy toward all people. And then this is the reason that we're told to do that. Um, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving and kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Um, and verses, verse three about being foolish and disobedient and led astray, I get to see um, hundreds of visual analogies of what that actually looks like every day. Um, and this verse just helps me remember that that was also me, um, apart from Christ. So um, kind of in closing, I've just been learning a lot about the sovereignty of God in my job too, because 
it's tempting to try to fix a lot of things for people um, or want to because people are so desperate and they just they also kind of expect that you can do a lot more than you can um, and so just trusting the sovereignty of God that he he is able to save those people um, maybe I am just taking them to jail maybe they're cussing me out the whole way and I have no chance to say anything to them at all much less share the gospel with them and just trusting that he has his people in place and he also has a purpose for me and how I do my job to hopefully demonstrate the gospel to them um, and so just some some examples of that um, that I've seen as well with with God's sovereignty and providing outside of my work or my shift um, we we had a recent um, standoff the barricaded person with a weapon um, someone else in the residence and I recently became part of the negotiation unit with um, joint special response team between us and Gallatin County Sheriff's Office so we get called out to these um, maybe twice a month and so he was pretty pretty down um, he needed to go to jail for a lot of things and he was not willing to go to jail and kind of gave us the option, either I'm going or I'm gonna make you take me out, um, kind of thing. So kind of, we had some people on the phone with him. It didn't seem to be going very well and I reached out to somebody who we had heard was his like adopted mom. Um, and I got on the phone with her and we hadn't heard from him in a few minutes. So everybody on the perimeter is pretty on edge at that point because we don't know what's going on um, or how he'll come out. So. I got on the phone with this this gal and I said, hey, I'm with the Bozeman Police Department, we're here. Um, do you have any information that can help me? And she said, yeah, I just got off the phone with him and he's gonna come out peacefully. And I told him that God has a plan for his life and, and God loves him and we love him and he needs to come out peacefully and, um, and surrender to the police. And um, that is ultimately what ended up happening. And so I said, I'll just stay on the phone with you while they handle that. That's really good news. Um, I said, he didn't say goodbye to you or anything, right? And she said, no. And she said, I said, I'm, I'm also a believer. Um, where do you go to church? She said she goes to church in the Valley here. And she said that she's been involved in this man's life um, since him and her son were in, in jail together. They met in jail. And then she's been a consistent um, adopted mom for him since then and so I just told her you know I think you talking to him on the phone made all the difference tonight because I'm still the police I could tell somebody that God has a plan for their life but I have no relationship with that person to base that off of and they they have they know nothing about me so um, God can still use that but I told her you know God used you tonight to um, to bring a peaceful resolution and um, thank you for being faithful and being an influence in his life and being a partners with us because this could have ended up very differently um, and we all expected it to end very differently than it did so that's just an encouragement for you guys that um, it's just a regular church attender here in the valley who took an opportunity and built a relationship and that was a very tangible result of that relationship was he just came out and surrendered and it was because he had hope beyond getting arrested um, he knew that there were people who cared about him, who loved the Lord, and um, and were able to talk him through that. So um, I'll wrap it up here with just some praises and prayer requests. Um, just a huge praise that someday God is going to win. I think that's been something that I've focused on a lot recently, um, that the darkness can feel very overwhelming. It's mostly darkness that we're dealing with, um, and yet someday God is going to win and we'll have a new world, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then another praise is just that we do have an awesome team of responders in Gallatin County. Uh, we have a lot of believers on the fire department and the sheriff's office and police department and in the ambulance. Um, and even unbelievers, like I, I just really appreciate our community here, and I think that's a praise. I think God uses that to um, flourish our society here. So that's something to be thankful for. Um, there's believers in each of those arenas, and um, there's there's just always so much, only so much we can do in the moment. So just an encouragement to you guys wherever you're working, 
um, coworkers, friends, just to be um, be there for those people in relationships that we can't be in, um, just by the nature of the job. And some of those things are just jail. Jail ministry is obviously one that comes to mind. Um, that's a huge comfort for me when I drop off somebody. Like, go to Bible study. It'll be great. <laughs> um, someone else can talk to you about the gospel. Cam will come in when you're all calmed down and not high anymore. So, um, And then just regular discipleship and relationships. I think that's really where the Lord does a lot of work. Um, like I said, I can uh, kind of just keep taking people to jail, and that's kind of my role right now. Um, and we can all be just praying. We can be praying for believers in law enforcement that we will not be overwhelmed by darkness, um, praying that the Lord would open people's eyes to see the light who we're dealing with, um, whether victims or suspects or bystanders, whatever it is. And then, um, yeah, that you guys would pray for me that the Lord would open my eyes to also find the darkness. Um, so I know a lot of you are praying for me and my safety, and I really appreciate that, and um, that's been instrumental as well. Um, and I just, I want my eyes to be open to find the crime. That's, um, I've seen God provide in a huge way in that, in the last two years that a coworker said to me the other day, you take a lot of people to jail and you run into a lot of like bad situations. Um, and I said, well, I have a lot of people praying that I'll find the bad guys, you know. And that's not to say that we're better than the bad guys, but that is what we call them. And it's just anyone doing, doing any crime in the moment. So um, just pray that I'll find drugs and find DUIs. And, um, and I think that's an important part of what, what God has for our community as well. And so that's all I got for you guys. Thanks for listening. Hello. I got a quick Hannah story for you. So Izzy and I, my oldest daughter, were driving, and we were leaving here, and North 7th, right in front of Walmart, we see a cop car, and we see all of traffic going north is stopped, and Hannah's there. I'm pretty sure she had her gun drawn, and there was a truck and two guys, and their arms are out of the door like this. And I'm like, Izzy, we got to pull over and pray. And so we pulled over into the Conoco right there, and we're just praying, Lord, send back up, send back up. And pretty soon, I mean, there was like three or four squad cars pulled up, and I don't know what happened. I don't know if I, did we talk about this once, maybe? Anyway, it was really cool. I'm like, what a stud. <laughs> so, yeah. I, too, have a pretty exciting job. Um, I get to teach wild, crazy kids all day, and it can get pretty violent. Um, the other day, I had a student in my guitar class having a guitar about, I mean, like, looking at me like he was going to hit me with the guitar, and I'm like, is that a fret? <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here. Thank you. Get it? Fret? Guitars have frets? It's really bad if you have to explain it, but okay, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a big dork. And I teach kids all day, and I usually try to do jokes every once in a while, at least to, you know, just to kind of break the ice. I have lots of stupid, dumb dad jokes, but, you know, it's something to just break the ice, to build relationships, to just, just kind of take it to the next level with the kids, you know? Um, so I've been teaching music for 20 years, so you were close, Ted. Uh, not quite 30, but 20. 20's long enough. It's been, I mean, can't, I can't believe it's, it's 20. I teach at Bozeman High, Gallatin High, and Sacagawea Mill School this year, and it, it's pretty much, pretty much a dream job right now. Um, I had it a little dreamier a few years back, and now it's like mid-dream, but um, I get to teach guitar. I play guitar with kids for three periods a day, so 150 minutes a day I'm playing guitar with kids. Um, and then I teach a six, sixth grade band and an eighth grade band, and... Uh, it's, it's awesome. Um, there is a lot of need, obviously, for the Lord in the schools. There's a, there's a lot of need for truth. There's a lot of need for love. And that's why I, I, I'm excited about my job because that's what I get to do is just love. You know, I get to um, show the kids love. I get to be encouraging. I get to be positive. I get to be a dork. I get to be like a high school kid all the time. Um, 
but I, I, I can build relationships and, you know, I'm always just looking for the opportunity to, to share, to speak truth, whatever it may look like. You know, I can't obviously just, I know what they need. You know what they need. We all know what they need. Every, they need the Lord, just like we do. Like, we can't live without the Lord, and that's what they need. But, I, you know, it's not my position there to just, hey, what do you think about Jesus? You know, I, I wish. I wish, but I can't. I'm not in a Christian school. But I can, I can be the light, and, and actually, I can't. The Lord can through me. Um, so I should actually try to get to what I'm actually supposed to talk about here, what I, what I planned. I probably overplanned. Um, sorry. Other than teaching music, my overall goal is to just show the students love, joy, and patience. And I think I'm getting better at that. Um, I have to say, just I have to tell you, just to, I think stories are really good. Our stories, Hannah's stories, our stories, our testimonies are really good to, to encourage each other and to help us know each other and to know the Lord through each other. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my life the last four years because it's been radical. It's been miraculous in my life. It might not look like a miracle to you, but to me it absolutely is. And to my family it absolutely is. And I'm not going to cry. Um, I, I had rheumatoid arthritis and so basically it, for like the last year it's been pretty good but for the three years before that it was absolutely pain um my wife and i didn't sleep together for months on end because i would be writhing in pain in the middle of the night there are many 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 mornings i couldn't put my shoes on um she was she would tie my shoes for me before i went to work <laughs> i would get to work there's this little thing at calton high where i had to it's like our sound system, and it's just this little box on the wall. You flip a key, you just lift it up to, and then put it down. There were so many mornings where I could barely do it. I was so weak. I could barely do it. There are many times I'm like, I'm going to have to ask a kid to do this just to play music. Like it, was, it was gnarly. It was gnarly pain. And But here's the thing, and I hope this encourages you because it absolutely is like, it's amazing. I don't have any pain anymore. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I, it, I'm just going to just, I, want, I don't want to, I, I got to cover it quick. But it was basically almost exactly a year ago. Um, I mean, it was low. It was low. It was dark. It was pain. We, there was a series of just event after event. Like my health was just going down. And the, the elders came over and prayed for us. And... Ever since then, it's been like the super steady, slow improvement. Now, also, along with that was the doctor that I was seeing. He always thought that it was bacterial, and he put me on a low-dose antibiotic, minocycline. Who would think? I'm on a low-dose, 100 milligram, minocycline. It was about the same, right around the same time that I got on that. Ever since then, it's just been super steady, slow improvement. I would say for the last four, five, six months, like no pain. So it's amazing. I tell you that story just, you know, so you know a little bit about me, where I'm at. But also that's really affected my job and how I kind of approach work because I went through going to work every morning, praying, Lord, Hebrews, I mean, this was a huge verse for me. Lord, strengthen the hands which hang down. My hands were hanging down. I could barely use them. I didn't even have knuckles. And my feeble knees, my knees were a mess. And make straight paths for my feet so that the lame may not be dislocated. I didn't want to be dislocated. I didn't want to be messed up, right? I should tell another joke. <laughs> I got to tell you, though, that through all this, I'm going to finish the verse, and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll lighten it up. OK. Uh, where was I? But the verse keep go, keep, goes on and said, so that the lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace. And, and I love that part, but rather be healed. That was my prayer. 
And he answered it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, sorry, I'm spitting sawdust. Okay, so anyway, I got to tell you, through all this, my wife is amazing. She battled for me, and I know a lot of you battled for me through prayer, and I thank you. And I hope that encourages you to battle more in prayer through all this, because that's our weapon. Am I really almost out of time already? But, but I'm really glad I didn't marry a tennis player, because to them, love is nothing. Okay, thanks. <sighs> so, that's as far, so that, so that is really, it's put me in a different place. This whole journey, the last four years, about just my job. I mean, I've had, I've had multiple occasions to really love on kids before that, obviously. I was a believer before that. Um, I still have opportunities, but I'm just, I think I'm looking at things a little differently now. I know I am. Um, and I just tell you that I'm so glad that, that I have the opportunity to, to pray for the kids, to just be a light for them. Um, I gotta get going here. Let me share another verse real fast. He, uh, Psalm 112, 4, light dawns in the darkness for the upright. And we are not upright without Jesus, but with him we are absolutely upright. And I thank, thank the Lord that the light did dawn, and it does dawn for us. Um, when I fall, this is in Micah 7, 8, when I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And he is a light. He has been a light. Praise the Lord. Um... I just want to tell you a little bit about some stuff that's going on in the schools. I mean, it's just same stuff that's going on in the world. It's just going on in kids. And, you know, I think, where is that verse? I'm looking for this verse I wrote down. Maybe I didn't write that one. Anyway, I think there's many strongholds going on, and we can pray against those strongholds. Our weapon is prayer, and God answers prayers, and the, right, the prayer of a righteous man avails much, and we can absolutely tear down strongholds. And I just, and I just encourage you all to, to keep praying against those strongholds. Whatever you think you need to pray against, do it, because it will. We are conquerors, right? Um, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, and he is a conqueror. He's a battler. He is a warrior, and he will absolutely tear down strongholds. So I think in the schools, I think there's a, there's a real stronghold of fear, especially with this COVID thing going on. It's been really hard to, to try to get to know kids who are wearing masks. Like, I mean, I could see that you really didn't like my jokes that much, but, be, but when I tell a joke and there's just, you can't tell if they're absolutely smiling or just, they're just giving you that, they're just like, all you see is this, you're just like, but I just say it anyway. But anyway, it's like it's been really tough with the mass. I think a lot of kids are really scared because it's just there's they can tell something's messed up in the world, right? And and it's just a daily reminder. Um, deception, obviously, there's a lot of deception. I mean, we live in a world right now where evil is called good and good is called evil. And there's it's I just. I'm just glad that sometimes I get to speak truth and just say, hey, that's absolutely messed up, you know? Um, I think there's just a real heaviness over kids, especially the high schoolers. Like whenever I ask kids about, um, what, are you doing? what are you doing this weekend? Every sixth grader has to tell me about their weekend, and I listen to them all, every single one, 40 kids in the class, and we take every Friday, it's like, okay, yeah, what are you doing? Oh yeah, skiing, oh yeah, what are you doing? Where are you going? And it's like, it, high schoolers, what are you guys doing this weekend? I mean, like, they, and it's not that, it's just that they're just, it's, I don't know, it's just really weird. And it hasn't always been like that. I think there's a real, a real war on excellence, especially in the young men. I think I really see a lot of the, 
a lot of mediocrity is just fine. Excelling maybe isn't cool. And if, and if, and if, I don't know, it's just really, it's really weird to see. It's just really weird. So that's something that's going on. There's suicide. We just had a student this last week try to commit suicide. Um, so yeah, I, I just be praying for that stuff. Um, I'll just have a couple quick stories. I just and then I got to be done. I'm already over time. I apologize. Um, just last week, I, I had a student just app just like hug me. Like that doesn't happen a lot, but they were super super sad. Uh, they're they're gay and they were getting bullied and their partner was getting bullied, and I was just able to talk to them and just show love and they have they just straight up hug me which doesn't happen very often and you know and ever, and ever since then it's been uh, really they've been really po positive and upbeat so that was nice to see um other students dealing with anxiety a lot um but yeah i just i just oh i, I want to show you this too because i know i'm speaking to the i'm speaking to all you guys that are doing this kind of thing every day and maybe this encourages you and maybe because it, it encouraged me because every once in a while I get notes and not very often. And I'm going to read you a note from a student that that I got and I'll just read it and then I'll explain a little bit more. But if if you would see the student, this is not what I would expect to that. This is not how I read the student at all, especially with the masks. It's really hard with the masks. But it says this. Hey, Mr. Merriman, your class is the bomb. Every morning I enjoy coming to your class. I've learned so much about guitar and I enjoy it so much I bought my own guitar. Your radiant positive energy is contagious and jokes are low key fire. I'm, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> and then, then thanks for making my mornings a bit better. And, that, and I was just like blown away. But it was so positive to hear. And I hope that you guys in your line of work get encouragement like that every once in a while. Um, it's so, you know, she, so hopefully she sees something, you know, and whether or not I get to speak truth or not, it's, it's all right. Maybe I can be at some kind of door. So will you guys pray with me and we'll just lift up the kiddos. Lord, we thank you that you hear a prayer and we just pray in your name, Jesus, that you would just be breaking down strongholds, that you would be winning souls, Lord. And we just pray that through this conference, through your word, through time with you, Lord, that we could be a light and we could be salt and we could just be used by you, Lord, because the, the world needs you, Lord, and we need you and we can't do it without you, Lord. And we just thank you that you are our strength and that you have the ability to do amazing things. With you, all things are possible, Lord. And we thank you and praise your holy name. Amen. Thank you. Have a good night. Hi there. As Pastor, said, Pastor Ted said, I'm Emily. Um, and I'm an intern here. It's funny because I, if you know me at all, I have my little five-minute sermons, I call them, where I, <laughs> where I just go off and the Lord was using it, I guess. <laughs> and he asked me to share this. But... Um, Anyways, set apartness. Um, this is something that I've contemplated a lot, especially while I was at CBI. What it means to be set apart. I think that, especially in the world we live in, um, we tend to have this idea that set apartness is just being different. But in our world today, like, different is good, you know? Like, you see that just pushed all over that um, it's good to be different or it's okay. But set-apartness is so much more than that. Um, I was, while I was at CBI, I was asking God, I was just like, what do you want me to do? Where are you calling me to go? You know, um, just really seeking him. And he told me, Emily, I'm calling you to be set apart. I was like, okay, God, what does that mean, though? <laughs> and um, one morning I was, I was outside, and I was just crying out to the Lord, and I was, I was saying, God, what does it mean to be set apart? Just show me what it means. And while I'm praying this, this huge flock of pigeons, I mean like 50 pigeons, fly up in front of me. 
and catch my attention. And as I'm watching them, all of them start flying away from me, except for one. That one pigeon started flying the opposite direction of all the others towards the sun. And one by one, all those pigeons turned around and started following that one pigeon until all of them were. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Emily, that's what it means to be set apart. Not just to look different. I mean, the pigeon looked just the same as all the other pigeons, but going the exact opposite of the world towards Jesus. Um, and we see the Israelites, this was their calling for them, right? God set them apart. He called them, he chose them to be a light to the nations. I mean, all the things that they had to do through the law and everything, it was so that they would be a light. And um, so Leviticus 20.26 20, says, And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. This is so beautiful to me because God no, not only calls us to be set apart, but he's chosen us and he's called us to himself and he's the one that sets us apart. He's the one that's called us and he's the one that sanctifies us. And so um, it was just, it's cool to me, just an encouragement. Um, thank you, Steve, for, for sharing about just the testimony that the Lord healed you. I too struggle with a lot of pain, but it's so cool to see how my joy through that can be a light to people around me. Um, you know that I've had people ask me like, "Man, how do you, how do you hold up?" You know, and I can point them to the Lord, and I mean that's I think practically that's what set apartness looks like, is running towards Christ, keeping our focus on the Son, and we will radiate. Um, so, yeah, anyways, that's all I have. So, thanks. So, as many of you guys probably know, my name is John Fricke. Um, I'm a deputy with the Gallatin County Sheriff's Office. I've uh, been working um, on patrol for about two years. Uh, I worked at the jail prior to that, and... I don't really have a ton of time to share this morning, or this evening, I guess. Um, but I will share a few things, a lot of which uh, Hannah hit on pretty well. Um, some of those are that there's a lot of darkness that we see in a law enforcement job um, that you kind of just deal with on a regular basis, and it gets pretty easy to... Uh, be pretty cynical and <laughs> see the depravity of a man and wonder how light could even shine in those places sometimes. Um, the things that I wanted to share with you guys today, again, I'm kind of trying to summarize this somewhat quickly, but the prevalent things that I see right now in our community, uh, the three big things are uh, suicides, is a huge thing right now. Um, Montana is ranked number three in the, in the United States for highest suicides. Um, approximately, let's see here real quick. Um, yeah, so the latest statistics for that is from 2019. Some of that is because of the pandemic and stuff coming in late, but the latest statistic is from 2019 which is pre-pandemic, pre and in the state of Montana, there was 280 completed suicides. Um, and there's a difference between completed suicides versus suicide attempts. Um, completed suicides is when somebody actually successfully kills themselves versus an attempt when somebody tries or, um, yeah, tries to hurt themselves in a way, and they are attention-seeking, possibly, whatever. Um, but those aren't really counted in that statistic at all. So 280 in 2019, and I can assure you that that statistic has not gone down at all. Um, if anything, it's gone up. I can say 
I can almost guarantee you that I wouldn't be able to go through a work week without encountering somebody that's trying to commit suicide. So, <laughs> yeah, that gets pretty difficult to deal with. And as you can tell, I am kind of emotional about it. Um, but it's something that I think is very prevalent, something I think that anybody can help with. And some of the best ways to help with it or to, to uh, interfere with it are uh, just to see the signs and to talk to people. The biggest thing is just asking them. If you see somebody who is self-harming through any various number of things like cutting or um, not eating food, stuff like that, people that talk about it and joke about it a lot, um, those are some of the signs. And people who have the ideation of maybe like that really create a plan or they talk about it in depth. If you ever encounter people like that, it's good to just talk with them. They need people to talk. Those are all them reaching out for help, essentially. So a lot of the suicide threats that we get in law enforcement are exactly that. So we get a chance to go talk to these people, try to prevent them from committing suicide, and um, get them to some resources and help that we have in the Valley. The resources in the Valley are great because they are there, but they're overwhelmed. That ultimately is what it is. And so they can't help everybody. They have to try to kind of pick and choose the more extreme people that they need to help. And there's people who are professionals that deal with that on a regular basis. Um, one story in particular that I have in regards to that, um, when I was working at the jail, people typically, when they get to jail, they're in the, a pretty low state of mentally. And it was Christmas Eve one year. I think it was actually my first year working there, Christmas Eve. And I was doing my cell checks. We have to go around checking all the cells, making sure everybody's okay, still alive and still kicking. And one guy just looked like he was sleeping on his bunk. I walked past him once. And, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> the Lord put a check in my spirit to check on him again. And when I did, I noticed that he had a torn sheet tied, tied around his head really tight. <laughs> and uh, I ended up, I was able to um, go in there and save that guy's life, which was crazy. <laughs> But it was definitely a pretty real um, example of how God was able to put me in that situation, give me that discernment to go in there. Um, I ended up actually hurting the guy a little bit, though. <laughs> um, when I was trying to cut the sheet off, I actually cut the side of his neck a little bit, and that was kind of scary, too, because I thought maybe I it was like, like going to kill him now that I saved him. So that was kind of like... <laughs> Kind of stressful, but uh, he ended up actually being really thankful, and I never actually got to see him again after the incident took place, but I heard other officers from the jail that I work with say that they were trying to, he was trying to get a hold of me and talk to me to say thanks. So that was cool, and there's incidences like that in my job on patrol. Um, typically, though, at that point, we're, we're able to talk to them, and they haven't done something typically yet, but it does happen. So be praying for that, and there's resources, um, and I think that there's a lot of things we could be doing, but exactly what to do, I'm not sure, other than pray and talk to people if you encounter them, and just have a relationship with people, have that relational evangelism. Um, the next big one that Hannah did touch on a little bit was alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs are huge in this valley. Everybody likes them. Uh, quick statistic. Uh, Montana is top five for the most alcohol consumed per year. And if you were to average it out, if every person in the state drank alcohol, everybody would drink about 3.1 gallons a year. So that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, Montanans like their alcohol. And it usually, like Hannah said, it usually extends to other problems. Um, and one practical way that God uses um, law enforcement is to arrest people for DUI, believe it or not, is 
weird as it might sound, you don't know what you might have stopped by pulling somebody over and arresting that person for DUI, for driving under the influence, and you take them to jail, get to arrange a meeting for them to go to the jail ministry, and then get them off the road, and you don't know what exactly um, could have happened. So in this job as well, there's a lot of, you could say, fruitless ministry, or fruitless uh, yeah, ministry that we get to do. We do a lot of things that could potentially help people, but we don't really get to see the outcome all the time. So, yeah, alcohol in Montana is a huge one. And that one, um, I mean, I honestly don't know how to combat that. I know they tried to a long time ago with the prohibition, and that did not go well. So um, I don't know how to combat it, and I think just prayer and praying for it. And if you, you know, have a heart to help people that are in that sort of position, there's, I think, not very many biblically grounded groups that, you know, there's like AA and stuff, but they're not necessarily biblically grounded, and they're good, but they always could be better, right? Um, The third thing, really quick, before I'm done, uh, is domestic violence. So that's something that even Hannah kind of shared about today. Um, That's something that actually is surprisingly low for statistics, but I think the reason that it's low is because it's not reported. Oftentimes, like even in Hannah's story, um, it was not the kid that called, right? But it was the neighbor in the neighboring room next door. Oftentimes, that not every time, but oftentimes, when we get a report of it, it's usually somebody else calling because they hear some ruckus or hear something going on or they see something happening. So that's when it's typically reported, and I think that's probably why the statistic is low because we're right in the, like the middle ground for domestic violence in the state, but I know that there's a lot more that happens than that's actually reported, and that is extremely difficult uh, to deal with. Um, the most recent, one of the most recent instances I had with, with one of these situations, um, we, we weren't able to really help this, this woman out. She was getting uh, pretty badly beat by her by her boyfriend he was getting kind of thrown around. They were throwing, he was throwing glasses around at her, and he tried to throw a box fan at her. Um, her head got thrown through a wall at one point um, on a prior incident, and she didn't tell us that until we were leaving. But she pretty much refused to get any help because she had a newborn. She had like a six-month-old baby that she needed to provide for. And a lot of times these people, um, and it's... Different, you know, men get abused from women and women get abused from men, but I'd say primarily it is from men to women. Um, with that being said, she felt that she couldn't go anywhere else. She didn't have any other help. Her family lives out of state. It's wintertime. She doesn't have a job. She's trying to provide for her kids. So she's feeling that this is the best situation to keep her kid alive. And so she was trying, she was being pretty closed off and not talking with us so we could arrest this guy. Um, I mean, because the stuff that it was doing obviously is not good. I mean, nobody thinks that that's good stuff that's happening. However, our hands are tied to a degree with the law and trying to get her resources and trying to get her help. There are some resources here. Um, One is called Haven. It's like a battered women's shelter. And they're really great, but sometimes they're hard to get a hold of because COVID and short staffing. And this particular night, there wasn't anybody that was able to answer the phone and they didn't get back to us till we left. And so we had to end up leaving her there. We tried to get her out of that situation as best as possible, but it was because she felt that she couldn't provide for her kid and it would, she would have been out in the winter cold, basically on her own, and they feel that they need their abusers to stay with them. So it's really, really sad, really, really tough situations that we encounter, I would say, on a weekly basis, to be honest. We go to situations similar to that, on a, like I could say, at least once a week, uh, on a work week, just like the suicide thing. We, we get DUIs every week, we get suicide attempts every week, we get domestic violence in some fashion, just about every week. And um, there's not really a ton of good resources for those things. Uh, there are resources, but not biblically based resources. And so um, I think prayer is the biggest thing, again, but if it's on your hearts, maybe it'd be good to start something. I don't even know. 
but uh, definitely if you feel free to come up and talk to me more about it later if you want. Um, but prayer is the biggest thing. Praying for law enforcement officers that are responding to these calls because it's hard. I mean, we deal with the darkness all the time. It's easy to become overwhelmed by it. So praying for us to have discernment, like Hannah said, to see crime that's happening so we can try to help and intervene on other people's behalf. Um, and pray for the other believers that are within law enforcement and first responder communities to be a light to the other coworkers that we have because they're morally good people. They want to go help people. They're in this job for a reason, but they all still need Christ. So be praying for us in that. Um, there's a lot of other crazy darknesses in the, in the valley here um, that are kind of mind-blowing that I could talk to you more about later if you wanted to talk with me. But, I mean, it goes as far as drug trafficking. There's gangs that live in, in the valley here. I mean, all this is in the valley. There's elder abuse, child exploitation, sexual abuse, sexual assault. There's human trafficking even in this valley, um, believe it or not. And all that stuff is here. And it's pretty easy to be closed off to it in our Christian bubble. So... Yeah, I just want to make you guys aware of that stuff that's happening. Not everybody necessarily knows. And if you want to talk to me more about it later, I'd be more than happy to chat with you. Um, one of the verses that's always encouraged me is actually Galatians 6, 9, and 10. It says, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So it's a good reminder to not grow weary of doing the good things because we will reap something in the end. Um, and to do good to everybody, but especially to those like brothers and sisters in the household of faith. But to do good to everybody that you come in contact with. We don't, you know, we, we owe that to people to be good to them. And it's... Uh, Definitely can be tricky, so don't grow weary of that, and that's all I have to share. I think we're probably past due for a break, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, really glad we were able to hear from, from John um, tonight. So uh, let's just close this first session, and especially a couple of things that John said. Um, I just really would encourage you to be in prayer about that. I believe there are some opportunities that the Lord would have for us as a church uh, to fill and meet some of these needs with, within the valley. So let's pray for those things, then we'll take a 15-minute break and come on back in. Father, we uh, do thank you uh, that you are near the broken, the brokenhearted. And Lord, as we've heard uh, some of these stories already being shared, Lord, our hearts begin to break for those in darkness here. And, Lord, we, we ask that you would mobilize our church and you'd send us, Lord, into these places. Lord, that we uh, might uh, meet needs of, of biblically-based, uh, uh, whether it's uh, drug and, and alcohol, uh, redemption, uh, either live-in or, or just meetings, uh, Lord, uh, or uh, just uh, uh, battered women's uh, ministry, Lord, if that uh, is rooted in your word. Father, whatever the, whatever you might lead us to, and uh, Lord, however you would send us, we want to go. And so, Lord, would you pour out your spirit, and, and would you open up doors, and, and would you use us to reach people in this community that are in need of your grace? Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.